Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tony Robinson with MAP, and welcome to today's webinar, which is a follow-up from the resident crisis uh, webinar we had a couple weeks ago. Uh, today, our presenters are Alan Rothenbucher of Benish and Bruce Flannery and Jeff Schultz from AMCO. Uh, just a few notes before we get started. We will be keeping all attendees muted throughout the presentation. Uh, we are recording the webinar, and it will be up on our webinar archives page in the next couple of days. Uh, you will need a member login to access that page, so just reach out to us if you need any help with that. Uh, there is time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the question box on the GoToWebinar pop-up to ask any questions. And if you have any logistical issues, you can use the question box and I will help you troubleshoot. Uh, with that out of the way, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> So I just wanna highlight our member discussion forum uh, like we did last time. We have seen a ton of activity here uh, since we split the material section into two, uh, one for material needs and another for members to post materials they have available. Uh, this image was actually taken a couple weeks ago, but we are already up to 215 materials needed posts and 117 posts for available material. Overall, we probably have around 700,000 pounds of materials on here and it's growing every day. So please, if you're a member, please go onto the forum and look. Uh, you could just make the difference for a fellow member and you might be able to get rid of some of the obs obsolete material in your facility. Uh, so that's all I have, let's get into it. I will now turn it over to Alan. Hey everybody, good seeing you all again or hearing all of you again. So just by way of update from last time, you all may remember that there were four mechanisms for which to insulate yourself from any kind of liability or excuse untimely performance or excuse um, delays in shipping. And so those were force majeure and that was tied directly if one of your material suppliers had declared force majeure, the recommendation was to make and pass that along right to your customer and declare to your customer that you were also declaring force majeure to protect yourself. For those of you that didn't have force majeure clauses in either your terms and conditions or in the contract with your customer, which would be a rarity because most customer contracts and most customer terms and conditions have force majeure clauses in them. Then I had suggested three other options for you. They were all law related. One was impossibility, one was impracticability, one was frustration of purpose, all relate to the concept of not being able to perform because of an unforeseen event. And the law helps you in pre, um, preventing. Uh, the law helps you in excusing your performance and not and being able to push back on costs. Some updates over the last since our last uh, call or last webinar, we have seen a lot more customers try to push back on and pass along costs because of delays and your in your indication to them that you weren't going to be able to meet deadlines. I have not seen anybody that has taken that to court, nor have I seen any customer that's been really affected to doing so because the simple pushback to them is twofold. One, either you say to them, look, we're just not going to simply pay it, nor do you have the right to charge it under our contract. That's option one if there's a force majeure clause, because force majeure clauses will say that they excuse performance and including any, uh, you're not going to be responsible for any costs associated with it. And for those that don't, the, and because your customer or your supplier, I'm sorry, because your supplier has indicated allocation, what you would say then is, look, the customer is allocating, sorry, the supplier is allocating resin to us. We're not going to be able to get all you need. Because of that, we're not going to be able to perform at a full 100% timeline or 100% um, production schedule. And because of that, we're just going to do it on a tiered basis because our supplier has forced our hand in that regard. And again, you'll get a response back. Hey, you're going to force us to shut down. We're going to pass along all those costs. And our response to that is real simple. Again, the law recognizes that. And from that perspective, you're not required to pay that. Again, we haven't been challenged in that. It really is a exchange of letters at this point. In large part, my belief is because these customer, your customers, are potentially going to submit insurance claims and because of those insurance claims they need to show their insurer that they've done everything in, in their power to try and collect and avoid the situation so that's why you have the exchange of letters many of you are even getting calls before the letter comes out and says hey we wink wink nod nod we got to do this and your response to them has been wink wink nod nod you're getting a response back from our lawyer let's see figure out if there's some way we can move forward this on an alternative basis now as you all know, particularly those of you in the automotive industry, 
getting an alternative uh, material, particularly one that's not designated on a part print or on a spec, is very, very difficult because of PPAP and the other validation processes. But you make that offer, you tell them, look, we're willing to, we're willing to assume the material, uh, do a different material. You guys want to help us? Let us know, but recognize that we're not going to be able to validate it as you normally require, and because of that, we're not going to be able to provide those warranties we normally give you with respect to those parts. And you just got to make sure you have that qualifier to insulate you from down the road, because as you many of you know, nobody's going to remember what you said in March. If there's a part that breaks down in December. They're going to say, oh, it broke down, and they're particularly, they're not going to willingly look at themselves if they said you could use an alternative supply as the vehicle by which you could make their uh, production schedule. So key motion, um, I've seen effectively being this being done in the industry. Again, unless I'm hearing, we hear from somebody else during this forum, I haven't seen anybody be, had to pay anything with respect to the costs. A lot of those threats about lines being shut down are really, I think, a lot of bluster. In fact, when I've talked to Tesla's counsel itself, his self, the response has been there, look, you know, we understand you've been trying to work with us. We're just trying to see if there's any alternative supplies, have you used your best data, your best sources to do it. And more importantly, a lot of times you're able to point out to, or at least I did to the Tesla counsel, look, it's not my client that's causing the issue. Frankly, my client told them about um, end of fall, beginning of winter, that this was going to be an issue, and the customer ignored him and wouldn't give forecasting, firm forecasting requirements, and wouldn't list, wouldn't listen to alternative suggestions we proposed on behalf of trying to avoid the situation. And usually that, well, in this instance, both times I've talked to him, he understood it. He said, all right, you know what? I guess I have to deal with my tier one guy. More importantly, to see if we can get them to provide more binding forecasts from all that perspective. So communication, communication, communication is key. All right, I'll be around for the whole thing if there's questions. Otherwise, I'm gonna pass it back to Jeff and Bruce. Great, uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to um, present again today. Earlier in the month of March, we gave a an update and um, we're happy to hear that it was uh, very well received and we're pleased to be invited back by MAP to, uh, to participate and provide an update here a few weeks later. Uh, AMCO uh, has been a primary sponsor of MAP since 2012 and have enjoyed our relationship with, with MAP for the last nine years. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present a market and industry update to you today. Uh, this is our view of the market. And in many cases, we're going to give a broad general overview. Uh, in the event that you need more specific details than we can provide today, be happy to have our AMCO commercial team engage with you directly or to discuss your business and how we can best navigate these times together. I'll go ahead and do some introductions. Uh, so I'm Jeff Schultz. Uh, I've been in the plastics industry for the last 23 years. I've been in both sourcing and commercial leadership roles. I joined Rivago and AMCO in 2013 and currently lead our engineering residence business. And I'm located at our North American headquarters in Orlando, Florida. Bruce? Hi, I'm Bruce Flannery. Um, my 40th year in the industry. Uh, first five were in the molding and extrusion side of the business. I understand that side well. Uh, for the rest of my history here, next 35 years has either been working for a producer or in the uh, distribution side. So. Uh, came here to Rivago also in 2013 as part of being uh, the purchase of ATOP and brought into Rivago part of AMCO uh, and uh, uh, spent all my life in the commodity side, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, PV6. So that's kind of my history. Jeff? Great. So just a few slides to introduce those of you to AMCO who um, may not be as familiar and then we're going to get into the agenda here. So. Uh, AMCO, we want our customers, um, as you look at this slide, this is we, what we want our customers and suppliers to think of when they think of AMCO, a fast, flexible company with an entrepreneurial attitude backed by the largest plastics distribution company in the world. So we are owned by the Rivago Group, um, headquartered in Arendonk, Belgium, was founded by Ralph von Gorp in 1961. And the business has grown substantially since then now with over 6,000 employees, 45,000 plus customers, 
230 plus locations in 57 different countries, a large number of suppliers of which 50 uh, we determined to be strategic supplier partnerships with an extremely broad product portfolio. Specific to AMCO, we are, as I mentioned earlier, headquartered in Orlando, Florida, and this is where our operations team and management team resides. Uh, we've got a very experienced sales management team. Uh, we've got over 40 sellers, many of which have greater than 20 years of experience. Uh, application development is an area that we've invested heavily uh, in order to help our customers uh, with innovation and growth. Um, most of our course, all of our core suppliers are contracted. Uh, we've got a large, broad portfolio of products with a world-class distribution network that allows us to get product to our customers as fast as we can. Okay, so for the agenda, uh, we're going to um, spend a little bit of time since on March 2nd, when we gave the initial update, some of you uh, were able to see that already, some may be new. So we are going to provide a little bit of an overview, although uh, a more concise version of the root cause of the crisis. We're going to give an update on the current state of the resin market, the effects on commodity, then engineering, and then we'll wrap up the discussion with actionable steps to reduce the impact of the crisis itself. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Bruce. All right, so a quick review of the root cause. This isn't just about Gary, uh, the big freeze in Texas. Uh, basically, this, this, the supply issues we're seeing are the culmination of many issues. So we had COVID-19 really is the beginning. Uh, the supplier destock uh, based on the unknown of demand and the, and, the, and the fear of demand destruction. In reality, we saw a demand surge. We'll speak to that throughout this. Um, then we hit the worst hurricane season in years, which ran out of hurricane names. Um, we see a logistics industry overwhelmed, that's both domestic and international. Uh, and then world demand continues to surge. Uh, it is unbelievable what we're seeing. Uh, the newest uh, numbers today, or this month actually, out of, uh, out of our own GDP per, uh, projections for the US are over 6% growth. So you start looking at all this and it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to stop, which is great from a from a sales standpoint, but a little tough on the supply. Uh, then Yuri freeze hits Texas. So um, kind of sitting here kind of going, what can happen next? I don't know, maybe we get plastic eating locusts. I'm not sure what's gonna hit, uh, but the reality is, is we just have had one thing after the next. Go ahead, now. next slide, Jeff. So we'll give a quick state of the resin market. And I kept this slide in. This one I shared, we shared at the beginning of the month. Uh, this is actually from a polymer plant, one of our suppliers. Um, the reason I left it in here now is they were able to fix the things that they saw, right? These are pretty obvious problems and they've been able to do the repairs. Um, we've got quite a bit to speak to it in a minute about kind of how many people are back up. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that there's as much of this happened that they could see and fix before they started up. There are more and more problems that are causing them to start up, shut down, start up, shut down on things that you that they couldn't see or predict would happen from being that that freeze that hasn't happened in over 100 years. So it's just kind of a reminder. This is the the worst of it from a from a visual, but there's also hidden damage that was done that they're just still figuring out. Next slide, Jeff. So the chemical industry flowchart. Please remember, if you'd like a copy of this, it's uh, you can download it on the Amco website uh, for free. Uh, it does print out to a two by three poster. A lot of people do find this handy, They've been doing this for years as a service. Uh, it does give where it all comes from as far as just how integrated we are and how far down the chain we are really from the, from the beginning of the, the crude oil or natural gas or coal or biomass now. Jeff, you can go to the next slide. So this one, now we're down into the bottom half, which is more the chemical industry flow chart. Um, it's kind of important here, uh, Jeff added the stars on this, which I think are pretty important because what it really shows is all that has to actually be up and running in order for you to get the polymer or us to get the polymer we need to get to you. So a lot of times what, we're, what we've been seeing and learning a lot of that we probably never would have learned without this is just how, how integrated we are backwards and how many things are reliant on the next thing. So just, you gotta look at this and say, I need all these monomers or all these speed stocks I actually up and running before I can get my polymer. Go ahead, next Jeff. Jeff, you want to take it from here? Sure. 
So um, during the last presentation, we focused on these kind of same four primary topics of supply, demand, labor, logistics, and inflationary pressure. And uh, the goal here really is just to continue to provide an update um, as we see these different um, topics. So from a supply demand standpoint, um, you know, the plastics market uh, reacted to COVID-19 and um, kind of with the recession of 2009 top of mind and a, a real fear of being stuck in a recessionary environment with a significant amount of inventory, which happened to so many companies in 2009. So what we saw was a proactive destocking across the entire supply chain during the second quarter of 2020, which uh, it's hard to believe that's um, basically just about a year ago right now. Uh, producers at this point um, are shipping from production, not from inventory. Uh, we kind of laugh internally that producers are shipping hot pellets. You know, it's not coming out of their warehouses. It is coming directly off the production line and, and out, to, um, out to customers. Uh, plants are operational from a supply standpoint, but they unfortunately are at reduced operating rates. Uh, many producers that started were in force majeure or de declared force majeure right around our last presentation um, are still in force majeure. I'm not aware of anyone who has yet exited. Uh, there will be continued limited relief from other regions of the world, whether that's Asia or Europe, as demand in both of their regions remains very strong. What we're finding now is that, uh, to Bruce's earlier comment, those feedstocks and derivatives are, um, are in short supply as are additives. And we've even seen now um, shortages of corrugated boxes. Um, domestic demand, which I'm now gonna get into a little bit in more detail, uh, continues to be strong, um, you know, whether it's packaging, healthcare, automotive, building and construction, electrical appliance or consumer products. Um, demand across the board appears to be very robust. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on automotive building and construction and, uh, and durable consumption here in the next few slides. Uh, I shared this slide, um, something very similar to it, which is from IHS, and they talk about um, automotive builds. And what I'll um, really just make a few comments, and that is when I gave this presentation with the February data, um, the projections at that point were that 2021 was going to be just right around 16.1, 16.2 million units. Uh, one month later, they've already revised the um, production rate of auto builds down by about 400,000 units due to shortages in the semiconductors that have been all over the news, as well as um, concerns around the ability uh, to provide parts to the suppliers for um, production. So uh, we've already seen a significant drop off. Uh, meanwhile, there continues to be a build in um, in needed production. So the, there, we're still looking at about a 500 to 600,000 um, vehicle shortage in, um, in demand. So demand remains very, very strong. What I'll also point out in this slide is if you look at 2022, 2023, 2024 on the far um, on the left graph, but on the far right, you can see builds are going to remain over 16 and a half million units a year for the next three years. So even though we're struggling to meet to meet demand required supply right now, if you look at the future, the future right now shows the automotive industry is going to remain very very strong. Another slide on automotive, and this just really talks on the far right of the graph. Um, what 2021 looks like. And that is the first quarter is going to be a little bit depressed. Um, but then when you look at the second and third quarter, it ramps right back up to what appears to be first quarter 2019 levels. So again, we're going to be looking at an extremely strong demand in the second half of the year. A different slide than, than last uh, last presentation, I thought I'd throw in something on building and construction in that market. Um, so what you're seeing here is a snapshot of new residential housing permits and starts from 20, 2016 to February of 2021. And you'll see highlighted in red uh, a significant surge in both permits and starts of new homes over the last 12 months. 
So if you look at February 2020, you were looking somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1.4 million permits. It dropped in April all the way down to a million permits. And then by January of this year, it surged almost doubled to, to 1.9 million permits. And you see starts is pretty much right along with permits. So what we're seeing is a very, very strong um, new housing, uh, new residential construction rate. Um, this one here uh, is the last slide kind of on the demand, um, the supply demand front. And, and this talks about durable goods. So this is from the US Department of Commerce and really provides a pretty good snapshot of where durable spending has come for consumers. So last time we talked in about the change in consumer spending that it was um, once we went into lockdown and quarantine, there was a significant consumer spending surge. And this really kind of just speaks to that again, but maybe with a little bit of a different picture. Um, so according to the US Department of Commerce, a durable good is defined as a tangible product that can be stored or inventoried and that has an average life of at least three years. So when you look at the second quarter of 2020 to third quarter, you saw almost a 11.6% rise in consumer spending on durables. And then it remained um, pretty strong in fourth quarter. And when you compare it against the preceding quarters on the left of the chart, you can see just what a significant quarter over quarter rise we that really um, means for our industry. I'm not an economist, but uh, I certainly am wondering if the latest round of government stimulus uh, provides an opportunity to continue to keep consumer spending on these durable segments at elevated levels for, uh, for some time to come. Bruce? So hit the labor section a little bit. Um, I know it's one of the things that's interesting talking to customers. Um, the first thing that we usually talk about after we talk about how bad the resident supply is, is how tough they are having with uh, labor shortages. So I, I think everybody kind of understands it um, from a processor standpoint, but the reality is, is this also hits, even though they don't need that much labor to run a polyethylene plant or a polymer plant per se, uh, what we're also seeing the big effects of are on the ports and logistics. Um, we're seeing the problem when you have an issue like we've had with URI and the shutdowns, getting enough people into the plants, have enough people available, the pipe fitters, the electricians, so on and so forth, to get in and do the jobs and fix fix things. Uh, that also caused last year because of COVID and the, and the fact that they didn't want to bring people into the plants, uh, they didn't want any chance of spreading COVID um, if, as much as possible to try to reduce that. They turned around and delayed maintenance. So now we've got suppliers shut down that don't want to be shut down right now, but they have to shut down because they already delayed the maintenance once. So that's just only adding to the uh, adding to the problem. Uh, we're also seeing shifting of the population. So people are moving out of the high cost areas, which is making it difficult from a transportation and warehousing logistics point where you're seeing like harder and harder. We're having a more difficult time uh, getting people into those facilities. Um, and the reality is we're seeing it on our on our supply side from the compounding side. So rehiring and keeping those compounding plants staffed uh, is being is a challenge. Again, usually, typically they can keep people separated well enough, uh, but it's still just an overall uh, problem. So I'm probably preaching to the choir, as they say, uh, with this group. But uh, we got to say that it, it's not just it's just not the processors. It's the whole it's the whole supply chain is also seeing the same effect. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, so this is an updated slide from um, what I presented uh, in early March. This is the Morgan Stanley Freight Index, um, which um, shows a pretty dramatic rise. So I'll, I'll draw your eyes to the red line in the chart, which is uh, 2021. When we delivered this um, the early March using February data, there were basically five orders needing to be shipped for every available truck on the road. And uh, one month later uh, in mid-March, um, it is now all the way up to eight. So not quite doubled, but a significant rise. So we are all fighting uh, right now in the logistics space with, um, it's certainly taking longer to book freight. Uh, it's a lot less reliable and it is becoming a heck of a lot more expensive to ship product. 
This is the uh, cash shipment index, which compares year over year percentage change in shipper volume over the entire nation's supply chain. And what you'll see here is that we've seen a 35% increase in overall freight activity in the last, uh, call it 12 months. Uh, and that number just continues to rise. When we looked at that number earlier in the month of, of March and in February, the, the number wasn't quite 35, but it was certainly 30 or, or beginning to, to broach the 30% number. So a significant increase. What we're also finding is that bulk truck capacity, you know, there's a finite number of bulk truck vehicles. So that specialized and finite number of vehicles is presenting a pretty significant bottleneck for the industry. Um, so the message here is obviously freight um, is more difficult to come by, it's becoming less reliable, it's taking longer to book, causing delays. So service, theoretically, we're seeing service down and cost go up. Um, this is a side-by-side -side snapshot of the port of Long Beach in Los Angeles. So the slide on the left was what I showed uh, in March 2nd. The slide or the uh, picture on the right showing it as of yesterday. And it's difficult to kind of get a feel for that. But what I would tell you is that um, there are slightly more vessels uh, that are in or near the port in Long Beach now than there was in early March. So it's uh, well over 60 vessels now. Uh, which continues to feed the backlog and, and challenges of getting those vessels offloaded. Um, and most importantly, getting those containers unloaded and if possible, filled back up to send back to Asia. And in fact, now what we're finding is that vessels are going back with empty containers because the value of those containers in Asia is, um, is so great. Bruce? All right, uh, quick review of this. Um, it actually got, we got another one red since the last time, since the beginning of the month. Um, but really it's, this is a good diagram of just how, how severely we were impacted or are continuing to be impacted. If you take a chemical flow chart and you kind of break it down now to the polymer side and just how much is in force majeure. So again, across the board, almost everything has got supply issues and is in, the, in a state of force majeure. So uh, this is not going away quickly. Um, and we're also really not, the thing is, we're also not seeing with the high prices, everything's up in price too, which is good because it drives uh, the suppliers uh, are totally incentivized to go get the plants back up as fast as possible. But the reality is, is it's the hyper prices, I would call it, are not driving away any demand. Demand still is very strong as we've spoken to. So this is kind of, uh, again, we're kind of in a unique situation. Next slide, Jeff. So let me, uh, next one here will be a few for me on the commodity side and kind of where we see it. Uh, this is an update for the February. So through the month of February, again, folks, we, uh, when we did this uh, back at the beginning of the month, uh, this was my way of trying to explain how we've been affected on the commodity side. So this is just PE and PP, um, and together they're 67 billion pounds a year. So when we took that number of 88% of capacity was offline in the Gulf Coast, or in Texas and the Gulf Coast, that means that 850 rail cars a day have lost production. Um, so now when we add up or finish the month, uh, that's basically since Yuri hit through the end of February, we lost production on 11,900 rail cars, about 2.3 billion pounds. Again, these are quick numbers, back of the napkin type stuff, but I have compared notes uh, with others in the industry and they're telling me that my numbers are realistic. Um, again, there is no hard data on everything, but everybody's telling me my numbers are, are in the ballpark, as somebody would say. So the big thing is, is that that production, because if you take polyethylene, polypropylene, they're already sold out before we Yuri hit, that production is gone. Um, it's not, we're not gonna be able to make it back up anytime soon. Jeff, next slide. So here we are in March. Um, March is getting better. So the good news, um, We've gone from about 12% running to now up around 75%. I will tell you that if I was to do this, this is a slide as of yesterday, um, after seeing some updates today and talking to some more people this morning, 75 may be a little optimistic of what actual, how much is actually being produced. Um, but anyway, it's in, again, again, it's in the ballpark. Um, we are expecting that to grow, still not full capacity, but probably up into that 80, 85%, hopefully by the end of the month in the next week or so. Uh, but the interesting thing is now when you take what we lost in February of 11,900 rail cars, and again, quick numbers, 
And what we've lost through March 20th, that's over 20,000 rail cars of lost production in combined polyethylene and polypropylene. So again, I, I can't stress this enough, we're, we are in a hole from a supply and inventory standpoint. Next slide, Joe. So what I really expect right now and what we're already seeing is uneven restarts in both polymer and monomer. Um, so you're gonna see situations where polymer is up and running, but they can't get enough monomer, so they're, they're held back there or vice versa where the monomer is up and running and they're still waiting for polymer plants. Um, polypropylene is probably the best example of that where you're actually potentially seeing a decrease in monomer price this month. Uh, but the people in the future are saying, once all the polymer plants are back up again, we could come right back roaring up again. So again, the future, we'll see what happens. But an uneven start is the best way to put it. Um, you'll also see by polymer type. So you may see certain family of resins. You may see injection molding, high density become more available than blow molding. We'll have to wait and see, uh, but you'll see different ones recover at different rates. And it's really just about what gets up and running and what gets feed stocks and what can be run. So don't, just because you have one resin or one supplier is telling you they're back up in 100% supply, that doesn't mean the other five suppliers in that market space are anywhere near that. So please be careful not to take one, one data point and apply that across the industry. Um, with the most of the plants back up and running, it's my opinion we have a chance to get most of the resin kind of back to what we call normal full allocation by the end of June, uh, which will be just in time for hurricane season. So when I say back to normal full allocation, that means I get to, we get to supply you with whatever that pounds were that you were buying every month. It doesn't mean we get to double up so that we can build inventory for hurricane season because I don't believe we'll have it to do that. Um, so we're probably all gonna go into hurricane season for the most part with very low inventories. I don't see us digging out of that hole until we get to kind of into third quarter. So again, you're gonna see specific grades of product families come back sooner. Even suppliers may come back sooner, uh, different ones for the same product types. Um, but then we're all gonna to wanna to restock. And I think the restock will take probably all of third quarter and may leak into now into fourth quarter. Uh, when you start seeing the demand, that's, that's if these demand numbers that are all coming out there. It's all just really a lot of it's come back out and just done a great job putting that together. And in the last week or so, in the updated GDP numbers, it's kind of like, uh oh, I mean, this is this all drives our demand, especially on the commodity side. When GDP goes up, we go up, um, historically, anyway. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, thanks, Bruce. So I've got a, a number of slides, uh, basically a repeat of the uh, resins that. I presented back in early March, so we're just going to take a quick run through um, those polymer families. Uh, I thought this slide, um, I was having a conversation with uh, one of our uh, core resin suppliers, and he used the term of we went from a frozen faucet to a trickle, and I thought it was uh, apropos to put into the slide deck here so you can see kind of where we are today on, on the engineering resin side, we're approaching a trickle. Uh, I wish I could tell you at this point when I think the faucet will be uh, full blast, but at least at this point we're we're not frozen and we're starting to get some getting product out. Um, progress is being made, uh, and certainly we're beginning to recover, which um, is good news. Um, what I did was I kind of put the questions that were being asked uh, in early March, uh, maybe even late February after the freeze. Are, are kind of on the left, and that was, you know, do you have utilities and power back to the plant? Um, do you have staff capable of at the plant that can run? Uh, when will I know what my allocation is? You know, are you going to enter force majeure or not? Uh, what what happens to my existing purchase orders? And did you what inventory did you have before the freeze? Um, that's kind of where we were. Where we are now is a kind of a different set of questions, which again kind of speaks to some progress, and that is. What is the plant's operating rate? Are all of your lines running? Um, are there feedstock issues that you're having? And if so, in what grades? Um, when will my April allocation be provided if I don't have it yet? And what's May looking like? Um, and then we're now getting into, unfortunately, some situations where we're having individual discussions about customers who have dropped dead dates or are shut down, and now we're kind of in a scramble mode to figure out how to get them supplied. 
Um, this really is just a summary slide and, and it it's a little redundant, but really wanted to say that a lot of these comments around demand apply to the resident families that I'm gonna talk on next. So we already talked about automotive, new housing uh, builds and demand for durable goods. Um, demand for appliances has been off the charts over the course of the last year. Um, demand for electronics uh, has been hampered a little bit due to the semiconductor shortage and demand for medical products has been very strong and we're expecting that demand for that market space continues and may in fact accelerate uh, once elective surgeries uh, are able to no longer be delayed and can resume. So now kind of getting into the product um, spaces themselves. So when you look at styrenic copolymers, domestic supply is really tight and is expected, unfortunately, to be all the way through third quarter. Um, domestic producers are on force majeure and their allocation allotments to the, to the marketplace are very low in March and April. Um, good news is domestic plants are operational, but they're just operating at greatly reduced rates. Uh, I've talked previously about import possibilities. The reality is demand in Asia right now is very high. Prices in Asia are rising and the opportunity to get ex uh, increased exports out of Asia just is not realistic at this point in time. So uh, the unfortunate reality is that we're gonna be looking at a pretty tough um, styrenic copolymer marketplace for um, what now looks like most of 2021. Uh, we will continue to see demand far exceeding supply. Price increases are going to continue. Um, and it's just not a pretty picture for styrenic copolymers at this point in time. Just to give you a flavor, and these are more industry announcements, not necessarily what um, we've seen in the market yet, but domestic producers have announced increases in the neighborhood of 30 cents a pound or more, and import products um, are actually up even more. On the nylon six and six six side, uh, if you look at nylon six, it's um, certainly supply has gotten quite tight due to force majeure in the nylon six polymer. Um, prices uh, are rising in the near term. I do think that supply in nylon six will be quicker to recover, certainly when compared to six six, and you're looking at probably late second quarter when nylon six can, um, begins to improve. And I mentioned, uh, in the early March presentation, if you're out there right now and have the potential to move from nylon 6.6 to nylon 6, um, that is a path that I would suggest customers that can should really begin to explore heavily. I just think that the supply and pricing of nylon 6 over the near term is going to be far better than 6.6. Getting into 6.6, supply was tight prior to the Texas freeze, and now producers are, are basically all in force majeure. Uh, on the uh, feedstock side, you had uh, planned maintenance in Europe that was slow to recover. Uh, domestically, we had hurricanes impact a plant, power outages impact a facility, and then uh, another one had planned maintenance. Um, all just continued to take supply out. And then on top of that, you have um, the Texas freeze impact, adipic acid, adiponitrile, acrylonitrile, and HMDA, which are key feedstocks into the production of nylon 6.6. Now you've got some additional challenges where there's shortages of glass fiber, other additives, whether it be flame retardants or antioxidants, heat stabilizers um, are now kind of making the restart or, or at least a recovery a little bit more difficult. Uh, looking at supply steadily improving and hopefully that improvement begins next month, but it's going to be a, a slower recovery. Polycarbonate, um, unfortunately, some more bad news here. Domestic producers are all on force majeure, uh, again, with very low allocations uh, domestically in March. Uh, supply is really tight, and at this point is expected to be through the entire first half. Um, there is no inventory. Producers, as I mentioned earlier, producers are really shipping from production. They're not shipping from inventory. Um, plants are operational, but again, at reduced rates. Uh, this reads very much like the ABS slide, just like it did earlier in the month. We've got feedstock shortages um, are really impacting operating rates and in some cases is even influencing grade slate production where 
a lack of feedstocks and additives is creating uh, an inability to make certain grades of polycarbonate. Looking to China or Asia for uh, refuge is not a possibility right now. Demand in Asia, when they've come back from their Lunar New Year, uh, demand has been uh, very, very strong and prices rising there as well. So what does the forecast look like at this point? Uh, availability is gonna be tight through the first half and I think we're probably not into, we're well into the second half of the year before we really begin to have an easing of supply and an opportunity for maybe prices to begin to abate. Uh, I will tell you that um, from a domestic pricing price increase standpoint, we're looking somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 cents a pound or more, and import prices for polycarbonate are, are multiples of that. Um, it, in some cases, prices are, are up three, four times what the domestics have, have done, and, and in some cases, even more. PBT, um, supply of PBT has been greatly reduced due to several plant closures and plan maintenance that took place last year. You've seen customers that were in nylon 6.6 didn't have an opportunity to move to six and they looked at PBT as a, as a potential uh, resin family to consider. Um, PBT tends to be filled and now there's a shortage of glass fiber and additives that are impacting its supply. Uh, availability is gonna be tight probably through the first half improving during the second half. And um, you know, imported polymer from Asia will remain de uh, delayed just frankly due to the logistic congestion uh, between Asia and North America. Looking at Acetel, somewhat of a similar story here. Supply is very tight and continued to be through the first half. Domestic producers are either on force majeure or allocation and we're seeing price increase announcements coming from imports um, frankly, on a daily basis. So we're starting to see the acetone market from a pricing standpoint really ramp up. TPEs may be a product family that hasn't quite been um, as impacted. Um, it's certainly uh, when compared to ABS and polycarbonate, demand has really been strong, driven largely from automotive. Uh, key feedstocks that are being impacted, um, Bruce talked already about polypropylene, but you can get into some of the um, EPDM and subs and curatives that are, are in short supply. Uh, at this point, we're expecting that things should loosen come second quarter. So uh, I think this one should recover uh, eas more easily than the other products that we've talked about. Last one here on an update in TPU, and we're seeing a pretty strong demand across all markets, especially automotive. Um, TPU has been hit uh, by the um, Texas storm pretty, pretty heavily. You can see there that feedstocks, um, key feedstocks are in force majeure and global supply is now below 50%. Um, in looking at polyether-based TPU, supply is gonna be tight through the first half. Several um, producers have declared force majeure. Um, polyether is gonna be in a much, much more difficult space than, than ester-based uh, TPUs. Prices on TPU are now up anywhere from 15 to 25 cents, depending on product and producer. And then lastly, um, a redundant slide from March 2nd. And fortunately for all of us, this hasn't changed. And it really just speaks to some engineering grades that are less impacted and more available for sale. So you can see products like uh, Sabic's Norill, Sony's Fortran, uh, Sabic Ultem, BASF, Ultrason, Eastman's um, copolyester line and any of Styrolution's transparent specialty products um, are less impacted by uh, what's going on in the market and are more available. Bruce. Sorry, let's talk about a few things uh, that we, steps that we think uh, you should be taking or, or and strategies you should be using to get as much of uh, resin as you, as you deserve. So <clears throat> the steps to reduce the impact of the resin crisis. So the, the first thing is work with the current suppliers uh, to confirm the allocation that they have and they have for you and confirm what their future supply looks like. I mean, these, this is the time. If you've been a steady customer for somebody and they're on allocation or they've been force majeure from their supplier, then they should at least be able to work with you and give you whatever that percentage is that they have. I would push back hard on them on that and make sure you're getting treated fairly. If you've been a good customer to them, steady customer, 
okay, you should be pushing them for your for your fair share. Um, make sure when you're doing that that you're also that your credit availability is there. I kind of tell you that's one of the things that we're all over, um, even just to make sure that the customers and our suppliers know that we don't have any credit issues, that we don't want anything held up at the last minute, and you want to make sure that that's taken care of ahead of time, not a problem at the end, because at the end, it's maybe too late, somebody else will scoop it. Um, always qualify the alternative residents um, and require multiple resident approvals. That's kind of kind of the normal here, and this just getting, keeps getting proven out. Uh, but lean on our, uh, us or on your supplier and technical support uh, for service on that because there are things that we can do to help you move into other residents more quickly or, or other grades. Um, work with an authorized distributor who has contracts of assurance. So that's always, if you're not going to work with the producer themselves, make sure you're working with the distributor who's actually a contract distributor. And you may be asked to give a long-term commitment now for supply today. So if there's material available and somebody that re and they have extra material to supply, they're probably going to be looking for something back and that's usually just they want to make sure you're going to be a long-term customer so do your best to do that so start being proactive now joe next slide i think one of the things that uh, again knowledge is 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 key right so know your drop dead date and volumes um so your suppliers understand what you're up against just calling up and demanding that somebody ship you a truckload of something doesn't really do anything for anybody right now, but everybody loves a story as the old, story, as the old saying goes. But if you tell us what you're up against, um, what you're trying to prioritize and truly partner up with your supplier, then you will get a lot more respect and hopefully can help me. You, know, you may not get exactly what you want, but at least you can move up the, the food chain a little bit. Uh, it, because when people understand what you're up against, they're not so afraid to, okay, let me see if I can maybe take some from another customer, work with them to give this person a little something extra this month, uh, depending on what everybody's doing to try to balance it as best as possible so that we all come out of this with as uh, much of our skin on as we can. Uh, get your POs in and get them out as far as possible as your supplier will allow uh, and plan on those being good POs that you're going to plan on take uh, because uh, that does give visibility for us when we're looking at allocations and what we're telling our suppliers. Uh, if you do see spot material come up and you do believe it's what it's being advertised is, don't be waiting to give that PO. Um, I'm going to tell you there's hardly any resin out there. Uh, what MAP's doing, what they're sharing up there on the on the board, back and forth, you guys should be helping each other out, and that's great. But also, if somebody comes to you with something and, and you get an opportunity, I would jump all over it. Don't wait. Um, and it's really not too early to begin the discussion of supply agreements with your suppliers. I mean, we are actually doing supply agreements right now with customers. Uh, we have to do a start date to be determined. Uh, but we can kind of get everything lined out and we can bring those to our suppliers. Um, so when we get out of, uh, when we finally get back to full allocation and our supplier comes off force majeure, what I want to make sure is that they have, they already know that we've contracted additional pounds and those are pounds that they want. So I'm, I'm backed up in that. Um, make sure you interview your potential suppliers and make sure that what options they have and become a contract customer. Uh, it really works. And believe it or not, if there's a small window right now that you may be able to be in a better position when hurricane season hits. Uh, it's, it's worth having those conversations. And even if it's not a formal contract, but it's a, you know, depending on the size of the order and what you're up against with your customers, you know, it may be a blanket order with take by dates, whatever it needs to be, but, you know, working with us, give us the information and that commitment going forward always helps. And one of the real important things you've seen, um, what's happened with the, when we start talking about transportation now with, um, Eight there's eight loads for every truck available and anything over two or three is a shortage on that, that, uh, on that numbering system, the way that they figured that. So giving us that extra delivery window. So if you, need, if you know you need the material next Tuesday, well, tell us that we can deliver it Friday, Monday, or Tuesday. Um, really makes a big difference on your chances of actually getting the material in time. I can tell you that we're seeing it all the time where we get confirmed loads and, and um, they, at the last minute, we get the notification if it's a full truck that that trucker disappeared. If it's LTL, if the truck didn't pick up today, oops, he'll be in tomorrow. Oops, turns into the day after, even though we all had it set up and their, their truck got full before it hit our warehouse, you didn't get loaded. So again, having that extra two or three day window is going to make sure you get it when you need it. So I just, again, it's kind of basic block and tackle stuff to make sure that you're doing everything you can to get your material in. But right now is a good time to be thinking that way 
a little extra time, a little extra time, a little extra time. And I know it's hard to say that when we're telling you that we're in force majeure and we are in allocation and you're waiting for the truck to get packed out. I, now I'm asking you for two to three days of a delivery window, but do the best you can. We'll do the best we can. Uh, again, that's partnership and we all try to help together. Uh, that, you know, that wraps up um, the, the formal part of the presentation and certainly appreciate um, the invitation from Matt uh, to be able to share this information with you. We hope that you find it helpful. Um, we really view this as an opportunity to, to partner with and provide a service to MAPS members and to the industry. Um, there's unfortunately not a lot of positive news that's been shared in the last two presentations. I suppose the good thing to take from this is that the recovery has begun, uh, which is, is a good sign. So uh, I, we made this offer last time and we'll make it again. Um, with what's going on with supply and certainly with inflation, uh, many processors are going to be struggling to have very difficult conversations with your customers and OEMs. If there's something that we can do to go shoulder to shoulder with you to your customers and help explain what's going on, um, come up with solutions, try to be creative, um, we will do whatever we can to go shoulder to shoulder with you to your customers and help you during these during these times. So with that, uh, Bruce, any final comments? I'll throw it to you. And if not, we'll, we'll go, I suppose, to Tony and Q&A. No, I just I want to again to thank you, Matt, for having us on, uh, inviting us to do this again. And uh, we really do, we do appreciate everything that Matt does uh, in a great organization. So thank you. Any questions? Uh, hi guys, yeah, uh, thank you, Bruce and Jeff and Alan for for giving that wonderful presentation. We really appreciate having you as well as uh, as our partners too. Uh, so, like you just said, we will now move to questions. So, attendees, if you have one, please send it in the questions tab in the GoToWebinar pop up. Uh, we do have a question already. Uh, it was mentioned before with the supply chain that we have moved from five shipments waiting for every truck to eight shipments per truck, what's normal for the supply chain and will it be a fast return or a slow return to, to that normal? I'll, I'll grab that if you want, Jeff. So kind of normal is two to three loads uh, available for every truck available is kind of what's considered a balanced market. Um, the problem that we have right now is, is well, twofold. Um, so being at eight is, is not unheard of but it's crazy territory if you want to put it that way um and everybody basically the truckers get to demand what price they want so you're going to see escalation ex you're going to see increased pricing um in order to hopefully drag more drivers in but the reality is is that there's a limited amount of capacity and we're also seeing the thing that's happening and we see it just on our own business where before we might have been shipping somebody material to illinois out of our illinois facility, but now we're stuck with only having that inventory as we're down to the bottom of our barrel. We've only got that inventory in our New York warehouse. Well, then that means we've got to further to ship uh, to make, to try to, and split and get every, try to keep everybody happy. So we're seeing this across the board as you disrupt the supply chain um, all, all over the place, uh, you're seeing the supply chain get stretched because people are shipping further than normal. We were having that in, actually in a measure meeting this morning. So as far as how soon it gets better, I don't think it does. It, to be honest with you, I think this may be kind of become a new norm for a while um, because we're if, if the GDP really growth does happen, that's forecasted um, and people start actually spending money again and going uh, with with the, once the COVID, everybody gets vaccinated, we could see uh, a demand that doesn't slow down on this. So I would expect that long term, you're going to see freight being an ongoing issue. Um, I know we're looking at different things. We're looking at doing more intermodal whatever we can, but again, you just, it's kind of pushing around the edges as much as possible, but this is gonna be an ongoing problem. So to that end, we, we are working with customers once we get allocations back to try to put resin, either make, work with us on a contract, we may end up putting material closer to you, uh, doing those types of things where we can put less freight in, because again, it's not only availability, it's cost is gonna go up too. Yeah, just try to help add a little bit of color if you just use uh, what the Morgan Stanley Freight Index is showing. And I know this is a bit of an eye chart. The red line again shows where we are in 2021. And then it continues in this light blue line 
and where you look at it, um, it we're actually going to be approaching another spike here, which I believe is what you're going to see here is uh, the peak of produce season. So as we enter the May through August timeframe, uh, there's a chance that logistics could end up getting even a little bit worse than where we are at the moment. Um, and it doesn't look like there's really any recovery back down to maybe that five to one level until we're maybe into September to November timeframe. So it, this is gonna be a, an ongoing struggle, as Bruce said, an ongoing struggle for uh, all of 2021. All right, thanks guys. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, we tried to place POs for May and June. They refused to accept advanced POs. What is that about? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure exactly who refused them. Um, I will speak to uh, what we can. What we are doing. We are at. The people are asking or or. Pre presenting us with orders that we haven't aren't able to confirm because we don't have allocation yet from our suppliers for those months. We are accepting the orders under the caveat that they will be have to be reconfirmed. But if you'd like to put your reservation in, uh, once we get closer to the date, then we'll do our best to either fill that partially or fully. Um, and we will give uh, kind of preferential treatment to the people who put their POs in first. It doesn't guarantee you supply, uh, but the biggest problem you're probably seeing Depends on everybody handles things differently, but on the supplier side, because they're in force majeure, uh, the actual producers are actually refusing orders from us ahead of time too, um, because they don't really know. I may have my April allocation, but I don't have my May or June allocation, so they don't want my purchase orders because they haven't given me what my allocation will be. I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I, another way to look at it, we've got some some producers who are wanting visibility which is what we've opted in our business to ask for visibility it's not a commitment of supply but at least as bruce said you get your reservation in and we want our system to have all of that so we can see it and potentially take action others are looking at it saying all that is is noise i don't know when i'm going to be able to fill it it may be a customer that has little history with us or what they're trying to place is far above their historical amount it's noise in our system and we don't want it. So I think maybe what you're seeing is just the, the preference of your supplier there determining that they don't want that system full of orders that they know they will not be able to fill. All right, uh, Bruce, Jeff, are you guys okay on time if we go a little bit over? Okay, perfect. We do we do have a more a couple more questions. So the next one is how does a supply contract protect a customer if we only have 20 or 30 percent allocation, meaning uh, how do you decide which supply contract customer gets that type of resin if you don't have enough supply? So for I think I can only again um, speak to how we're managing it. So for us, contract customers are the first customers that when we are in an allocation position, they're the first ones that we serve. Then after that, it's those customers with historic consumption, we take care of them. And then after that, if there's anything left over, you begin to um, fulfill orders that come in that are either not under contract or there isn't historic demand. So even if you're in a 30% allocation, as a contract customer, you are going to get, you should be getting first dibs. So uh, I think that even though you're not going to be happy with what you're getting as a contract customer, you will be first in line. Yeah, and I, and I would just like to add to that is that the, the reality is, is that contract customers first, it doesn't mean you're going to get more than you contracted for, more than you had orders in for, but we have, we're going to do our best to fulfill those orders first. And right behind those are our steady customers that had the orders in ahead of time before an issue happened, right? So the people that worked with us. So um, although we may be on an allocation, um, it doesn't mean you're, that you know, basically we are gonna walk away from spot business that we had, I can tell you, especially on the commodity side, there's a group of customers out there that just wanna buy in the spot market. And I may have allocation of 50% and maybe half of that, half of that 50% that I'm getting I actually was using for spot customers. So I'm actually, I may have allocation of 50%, but I may be able to get my contract customers 75% because I'm not gonna support my 
my spot customers. So it's a little bit different for us as it's a distributor, how we can handle it versus a producer who has to more or less treat, who actually does the formal force majeure uh, declaration is really going to treat all the customers the same. And uh, so everybody, if they're 30%, gets 30%. And I don't want to get into the weeds, but there it's a little bit, we're a little bit of a buffer and, and can sometimes be a little more advantageous to our, it'll be some more advantageous to the contract customer with us. All right, we have one more question. Uh, given the high value of accurate data, has AMCO suppliers met their earlier stated projections of material availability? Bruce, you want to talk about commodities first? Sure, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so on the commodity side, um, I can uh, probably, I would say that about 75% of them are meeting the number that they thought they could meet. So otherwise they gave me an allocation for April uh, or gave us an allocation for April based on restart in April. So it wasn't, they didn't give us an April, excuse me, a March allocation. They didn't give me a March allocation for rail car shipping in March based on inventory they physically had. They gave me the best guess of what my March allocation would be with the restart of the plants when they best thought they could restart them. So again, it was a hope um, to a degree. And I would say about 75% to 80% of that hope has actually come to fruition. Um, unfortunately, I can say I have, unfortunately, I have got none that got more than what they hoped for. Uh, I do have quite a few that I'm going to get what we, what they hope to give us, but it's literally shipping next Tuesday. Um, so it's going to be really warm pellets that are made over the weekend. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of what we're up against. Um, so again, and then the other 25%, I would say we're not getting either, we're not getting any allocation or we're not getting a full allocation. So um, it's it's not a full recovery and it wasn't a guarantee uh, for the most part. It was more, hey, our best effort based on what we think we're going to, when we, we can have the plants back up and running. Jeff, do you want I think the March allocation numbers um, have been a little bit difficult because uh, to Bruce's last comment, um, the allocation numbers were given with the assumption of, of their plants restarting. Uh, there really wasn't a whole lot in, uh, of inventory on hand that they could ship from. So what they had in inventory is gone. Um, they've shipped everything that they had at this point. And in March's allocation, I would tell you has probably been right around, I think that 75% number is a pretty, pretty fair assessment. Some suppliers better than others. Um, I think th what we're finding though, is that the allocation might be, for example, we're gonna now get our April allocations. The April allocation doesn't mean you're getting it April 1st. They may, suppliers may ship the last week of April and it's technically still an April allocation. So I think we're gonna find over the course of the next six to eight weeks, some challenges of you you may get your allocation, but it may be at the end of the month, not necessarily in the beginning or the middle when you really needed it. So there's gonna be some pretty, uh, maybe some fits and starts with when inventory comes in. Uh, that's gonna be the real challenge for the next, I would say eight weeks. All right, uh, one more question. What effect, if any, has the resin crisis had on the ability of resin producers to develop and launch new technologies as it is my assumption there is tightness in their available resources. I think that um, at least on the engineering resin side, the, the continued work on R&D, I, I would say that that's likely been, um, hasn't been interrupted a whole lot. You know, the engineering side, the life cycle is, is so much longer. I think that those those efforts are going to continue to go uh, regardless of where we are right now. Uh, things that were in process are going to continue to be in process. Uh, the issue may be when those technologies actually ramp up and are at full scale. But I don't envision that the R and D efforts at this point are are really starting to wane. On the commodity side, I would kind of uh, mimic what Jeff just said as far as I don't think you've seen any slowdown from what people are working on from a development standpoint. Um, but you, but one thing that really has been affected on the commodity side is the completion of multiple plants that were on, that are out there and being built. So if you take 
all the additional polyethylene capacity that was slated originally to come on last year and this year, it's because of COVID and the slowdown in construction, a lot of that has been delayed till next year and the year after. So uh, not so much on the R&D side, but it is the implementation of that new technology and those new plants uh, that we had expected to be up and running right now are not up and running. So um, again, they will start, they will eventually start, um, but they are behind schedule um, really due to the COVID. You know, basically, the COVID has been the big, the big killer at the moment. Um, these things are hard to start up anyway, uh, and it's huge projects, five-year projects, billions and billions of dollars. But the reality is, is that you know, it's it's they've been severely affected by how many people they can physically have in those plants, building them and finishing them. So uh, that's probably been the bigger effect. That you know, prior we would have expected that this new capacity, if it had come on we would have been able to do a faster recovery from URI. Uh, and some of the new, new plants that were coming on were in URI's path, if you will, uh, with the additional capacity Nova has in Canada and the, the new shell plant on polyethylene um, and the Bor Borstark technology plant out in, in Louisiana. Those areas weren't as affected. So unfortunately, because of COVID and because of everything else that's happened, they're not in a position to help us out uh, recover in the marketplace. All right, so we don't have any more questions. So again, I wanna thank Amco and Banish for offering uh, the information today. Uh, just a reminder, the recording will be up by the end of tomorrow on the MAP website. Uh, we will be sharing the slide deck and uh, you know the contact information for Bruce and Jeff. So uh, if you have any further questions or, or you wanna uh, chat more, uh, fee, uh, feel free to reach out, please. Uh, and thank you to all attendees for being here. And I'm now gonna end the webinar. Everyone have a great day. Thanks.